Okay, yeah, well, let me just sort of uh, uh, encourage you to, to keep going in, in that direction and maybe just uh, by organizing your thoughts around the title of your paper. So you say not literal history, but literary art. So could you explain that title and why, why it makes sense here? Sure. Um, so Khalafala is making the argument that we should not read the Quran as a scientific or historical text. This is something that I think many traditionalist Muslims would agree with, um, but at the same time, they would take the stories in the Quran as being his literal history and historically accurate in that sense. And Khalafala is arguing that we should not insist upon this. And by insisting upon this, we are opening up a door for the, and then he lists off who his supposed opponents are, which are uh, the Christian missionaries, the atheists, the orientalists, to attack and impugn uh, the Quran and the prophet. And I think this is ultimately correct. Um, and what I find interesting about Khalafal and helpful to me at least, was that um, his book does not focus on the issues of, um, so what usually uh, upsets Muslims, um, including myself, was when you find out that there's a uh, certain tension or difficulty when you're reading the Quran literally with historical and scientific data that's coming external to the Quran. Um, but what Khalafullah's text is actually doing is it's primarily focusing on internal, uh, something internal to the Quran and realizing that even with that alone, we have a reason not to take it as literal history. Mm -hmm. And that is exactly the point that you raised, which is the issue of parallel passages. Mm -hmm. um, and I think this is, uh, again, I'm uh, thinking of Dale Martin or even Bart Ehrman, sorry, Sheikh Bart Ehrman for many Muslims. Um, <laughs> uh, but uh, when they talk about when you're reading the gospel, um, most believers tend to read the first gospel, uh, the next gospel. They read them independently, mm -hmm. but what, he, what they advise is actually you can put them side by side and read them, when you read them side by side closely, you'll see that the uh, renditions vary. The, so it's, it's narrating the same events um, or many of the same events, but they're doing it in different ways. And then you start thinking about, well, what does that mean? Um, especially if you're taking that literally. And so I think what I wasn't, I never did it myself. I never did it with the Quran, uh, but after reading Halafullah, I started, I started doing that. And then, you know, you realize, well, there's a problem if you take this literally. Um, and yeah. so Khalafala is trying to address that issue. Right, right. And I, I'd like to raise um, a couple of examples of um, those internal variants or parallel passages. Uh, but interest, I mean, I think your point is that you can come to a certain insight by studying those parallel passages, which also allows you to deal with places of uh, tension or um, disagreement between inter internal material in the Quran and then scientific historical data external or outside of the Quran. Is that right? Did I understand? Yes, that's correct. Because ultimately, this will come down to what one's theory of prophecy and revelation is, the model of theory of prophecy or revelation. And um, so what's the, the, the model that's become common and popular today amongst Muslims is the Hanbali model, which is of the pre-eternal, uncreated Quran, mm -hmm. such to such an extent that many an Western analysts and even some good academics will mistakenly portray it as if this is the only model that has ever existed and that it's always been the dominant model, which I contend is not the case. Even the Ashari model is, is different than that um, and would allow you some wiggle room but ultimately there are other models as well. And the, the model that I think that I have come to as the only one that I, and this is where I push Khalafullah a little bit because he didn't really address this issue, but I think you need to in order to accommodate his viewpoint um, is that I've come down to the view that the model of the Islamic philosophers, the classical Islamic philosophers, the philosopher is the only one that can credibly account for 
mm -hmm. what, what we're going to later discuss. Mm -hmm. But basically, their view in a nutshell is that um, uh, scripture and religion in general use the language, use a symbolic language to convey deeper truths, and that we should not take these literally. Um, and that even though the masses are supposed to take it literally, um, the intellectual elite um, understand that these are allegories or their symbolic language uh, pointing at higher truths. Mm -hmm. And I think that is a very compelling viewpoint that we should kind of uh, rediscover. Right, right. I'm just thinking. And, of... it, and it, sorry, yeah. and it matches up with everything that I've studied in religious studies. Mm -hmm. And um, it, it, it's very similar because, mm -hmm. um, you know, I'm thinking of Carl Jung, Mircea Eliade, et cetera. Um, they're, it's very, it's almost as if they're reading the Islamic philosophers mm -hmm. in some sense. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. I'm thinking also that Abu Zaid, uh, once he moved to Holland, uh, he, I, he thought of Ibn Rushd in some ways as a um, conversation partner, partner model for his own thinking about some of these issues. And I believe he titled his chair when he was given a chair in a Dutch the, university. Ibn Rushd, uh, chair. Yeah, it was the Ibn Rushd chair, right? Yeah. And recently, uh, Mustafa Ekul in his, his book, Reopening Muslim Minds, is very interested also in in Averroes and Ibn Rushd. And um, so, yeah, oh, we could return to that. But let's, let me just point out a, a few examples, which are your examples from your paper for Iksa, um, uh, that Khalafallah uh, uh, uses to think about the nature of the Quran. So he points to, for example, uh, divergences or differences in the different ways that the story of Moses's encounter with God, uh, which those who know the Exodus narrative will think of as the burning bush story. Uh, so in sort of Taha, we have Moses saying, stay here, verily I have spotted a fire, perhaps I shall bring you a torch therefrom, or find guidance at the fire, that's sort of 20. In sort of the Naman 27, we re read different, differently, verily I have spotted a fire, I shall bring you some news therefrom, or a torch, and happily you may warm, warm yourselves. So now a new idea of warming yourselves, the usefulness of the fire. And then Surah the Qasas 28, Moses says, stay here, I have spotted a fire. Perhaps I will bring you some news therefrom. Uh, so no mention of it, uh, uh, or the, the order is a, is a bit uh, different from Surah Taha or a torch that happily, that is happily meaning perhaps, or it would be good that you may warm yourselves. And then, uh, you know, the Halafala notes that God's responses to Moses actually vary even more. And I don't think we have to enter into the actual niceties of, you know, the words uh, that diverge or differ. The basic point is here you have this account where uh, in three different places or versions of this account, the, there are differences in the wording of Moses. And so it leads to the question of, uh, did Moses say one of these sets of words and not the other two? Uh, um, or is there another way to approach it? Of course, I don't want to complicate things too much, but even most Muslim intellectuals would uh, probably say that Moses was not speaking in Arabic. So that's kind of another issue. So are, can these be his very words if he originally spoke in some other language, whatever it was, Egyptian, uh, Hebrew, etc. So anyway, I mean, yeah, could you comment on, on the importance of this example of uh, differences within uh, variants of the same narrative? Sure. So what Khalafala notes is that most Muslim scholars um, have usually engage in a process of harmonization where, and this is the case amongst believers in the Christian tradition as well when it comes to the Gospels. Mm -hmm. um, and so, yes, and all, exactly. Um, so uh, the problem with that Halafullah points out is that these are separate stories um, and narrated for different purposes at different times in the prophet's life. Um, and so by harmonizing them, you're, you're not realizing that they have different purposes and different ends at that particular moment. So you're kind of misconstruing the story. Um, the other problem is that uh, the harmonization um, process, mm -hmm. it, it, it involves a lot of textual acrobatics and it strains 
credulity, I would say. Um, and so for an exa example is, an even better example, I would say, is there's the sometimes the same uh, quotation is attributed to one figure and then sometimes to another figure in the Quran. So one example, of the examples- the, An example you show is that the uh, sorcerers of Pharaoh at one point say something and another point it's Pharaoh himself who Correct. says the same thing. If so I they, that right. Yes, that's exactly right. So there's verily, this is a knowledgeable sorcerer. Um, that quote is attributed once to Pharaoh and then the other time to his like ministers. Mm -hmm. um, and so who said it? Now, one way to harmonize this is to say, well, they both said it. Um, to me, that doesn't sound very convincing. Um, and so that's often what goes on is that you say, well, okay, both things could have happened, um, or this was revealed twice, or, you know, there's a ways to harmonize, but I think what ends up happening. And so all of my viewpoint on this is, uh, sorry, all of my uh, approach to this is that, um, look, there are ways to accommodate the data. Um, but what happens is eventually, you're just forced to change your paradigm. And this is like where I think of Thomas Kuhn. Um, the theories can accommodate a certain amount of data, but then eventually it's just overwhelming. And then you realize, no, you need another paradigm. You need a paradigm shift. Paradigm shift. Yeah. And so for me, I've realized that we need the paradigm shift because all of these points of data. So each on, on each of these individual points, I think a traditionalist Muslim can respond and give an explanation and it might be semi convincing, but it's when all you put all of these data points together. I think it's just easier to change your par paradigm. No. And so that's, that's what I'm on. And, and the other thing is, I would say is going back to models of prophecy and revelation is that if you're taking the view, which has become common of the pre eternal uncreated word of God, um, that's verbally dictated to the prophet by Gabriel, um, then I do think there is some problem of even paraphrasing or rephrasing things so even though when you i'm sure for many viewers when they're watching and hearing those three renditions that you said of uh the moses uh the burning bush mm -hmm. i think they would sound almost alike uh, identical it's only when you actually sit down and look at it you realize oh no there is there are differences and there are differences in word orders so which one is it if it's just one event that happened and it's a literal historical event, then really he could have only said it one way. And if it's another way, then are you saying that God is not able, if you're saying that it's God's word, that's the pre-eternal uncreated, then why is he not able to get it right, exactly right? For us, we might paraphrase because we're fallible human beings, but if you take that model, I think it does pose significant problems. And I think what, part of what's at stake trying to think theologically along with the text is, is the Quran offering what Moses really said, or is it offering what God said for the sake of Muhammad or his audience? Does, does that make sense? Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. So uh, this is an insight that Khalafullah has, which I agree with when he's talking about, so he, he talks about, um, past prophets and past nations that are mentioned in the Quran. And what he starts to realize is that um, they're actually all talking about the prophet. And uh, a lot of the verbiage is the exact same. So the accusations that the people of past prophets were levying against them is exactly the same critique against prophet Muhammad. And really, it's just typology that's going on. And so the point is that those past stories are being narrated for purposes in the prophet's present, uh, prophet Muhammad's present right. in, in his time. Um, yeah. And so this is something that I get, I think is really obvious to um, non-Muslims who are reading, um, but it wasn't obvious to me as a believer. Mm -hmm. And the, re the way I think of this is because I actually, uh, in one of the classes that I was a teaching fellow for, we assigned um, certain surahs and the students were mostly non-Muslim. They actually, in their responses, they were immediately realizing that, oh, these are very similar to each other. And it seems to be depicting the prophet's life story, Prophet Muhammad's life story. Mm -hmm. And for me, this was 
it took reading a lot to let for that light bulb to go on and i thought it was this great epiphany and then i realized oh these people with no backgrounds were able to understand that and so i think there's a a cognitive switch that has to go on or allow you to actually view right. that right. and then once you realize that then you uh and this is where khalafullah's kind of apologetic aspect is coming and i say that in a positive way is that he's responding against one of the critiques of the quran that it's haphazard and um it doesn't seem to follow the natural flow you would think it would follow so why why in this one surah is there just this one uh prophetic figure mentioned after another without actually delving into their stories and it seems kind of haphazard and then it goes back to muhammad and then it goes back to past prophets and it goes back to muhammad he's saying once you realize that the emphasis is not about retelling stories for their own sake but rather it's literally about what's going on in the prophet's life at that particular moment this will then help explain why the quran is structured the way it is and i think this right. is uh, convincing right. i, I want to bring up one more example here that you highlight uh and which i think speaks to the uh I don't know what the right way of ex expressing it, but the, the focus on the Prophet Muhammad's own circumstances, um, that is Khalifullah's focus on those circumstances in his reading of the Quran. So let me get on to the example before I become too incoherent. Uh, so in the story of Lot, uh, we have um, a couple of different versions, but there are two in particular, which speak about his encounter with his people. And in Surat Hud, uh, there's a question that appears where um, Lot says, oh, my people, is there not amongst you a man of sound judgment? And then in Surat Al-Hijr, uh, the question's missing. So, um, I mean, just thinking along with you here, if one were to harmonize this, um, you could simply say, okay, a Lot really said this. Again, what language was Lot speaking? That's something that sort of interests me theologically, but forget about that. Lot, Lot really said this, and it's just mentioned in one place and not in another. But Khalafullah makes a point that, no, um, God was, I don't know, almost uh, providentially ministering to the Prophet Muhammad's own circumstances. And uh, at a certain point, there was still hope for the conversion of the Meccans. And then later on, uh, that hope had basically gone away. I mean, before the Hijrah, obviously things turn out differently in the end. And so the question is missing. I, did I get, get that right? Or, and how would you comment on that? Yes, I would say that's correct, except I wouldn't say that. Um, so Khalifala also mentions another excellent point, I think, which is he points to a certain verse in the Quran in which it says, it. I'm paraphrasing, but it doesn't matter if you uh, preach to them or not, they will not believe. Mm -hmm. um, and he says, Khalafullah says, the Muslim scholars, and so this is another insight that I think of Khalafullah that's, you can see why I think it's important for Western Quranic studies to appreciate, is he, he argues that we need to understand the Quran in its own context, which is a fundamental principle that we follow, we try to follow in Quranic studies. Um, he said that the problem is that later Islamic theologians and exegetes superimposed their own theological beliefs and things that they were struggling with onto the text. So for example, here, they made it a, an issue about qadr or predestination. And they said, see, this verse is saying that they will never believe because God has predetermined their unbelief. But Khalafullah says, uh, this is actually misreading the Quran because you're taking it literally as opposed to from a literary perspective. Mm -hmm. So he says, in fact, we know that the vast majority of these people actually did convert to Islam and did believe. And so we shouldn't take this uh, as a literal, in this literally literal way, but rather it's it's kind of rhetoric. It's, mm -hmm. you know, it's, it's actually, and the, and the main thing is that it's trying to bolster the prophet's heart. It's mm -hmm. trying to say that don't worry, you're doing you just have to do your job and don't worry about their response right. they're stubborn people um but not to take it in this very literal way but your point here is well taken that um these two renditions of the story of lot are different based on the circumstances of the time so in one circumstance the prophet is much more hopeful uh, 
that his people, his own people, are going to come around to his message. But in the second rendition, he's distressing over this fact. Um, and that's why the story skips to the punishment aspect when it's narrating about the people of Lot, as opposed to the previous rendition. And so he's highlighting these differences, and I think that's important. Right, right.